My name is Tom Mullen and I'm on the faculty at Unity College, uh, just down the road a little bit from here. Uh, we always like to say UMF is a sister college of Unity College, a similar type of education and outreach. Uh, and today we're going to be chatting about interpretive messaging for your signs, your, your publications, Wayside and Chaos. It's not just Wayside and Chaos. When I was chatting with uh, Susan back in, several months ago about presenting at the conference today, uh, I, and I gave her a couple ideas of, of topics I could talk about, and she thought this one would be relevant for a lot of the Lake Associations have newsletters, they also have uh, publications sometimes, they have uh, uh, waysides or signage that they like to share and tell the story of the lake and the history behind the lake. And I know that there's a range of budgets for lake associations ranging from zero dollars to, uh, you know, like we just learned, a uh, million dollars for uh, uh, cleaning up uh, the algae blooms at uh, East Pond, which is an amazing story in itself. But I just, what I have uh, for you all is on the website, Susan just mentioned, and uh, for a group, there'll be a link, Google Drive, to this entire presentation. Uh, there's all, I'm only going to be covering part of this uh, talk. Come on in. Uh, but you can access all the information and resources uh, afterwards, and, uh, and it may be very helpful for you to do so. so a lot more content on the slideshow than I'm going to get into the presentation. Just to give you a little idea of who I am and where I come from, um, I'm an associate professor of Parks and Forest Resources over at Unity College, and in a blink of an eye, I've been there 20 years. Never thought that would be, uh, I, I've never been in a job that long, so it's like astonishing in itself. Uh, but prior to that, I was, uh, had been an executive director of a couple land trusts here in Maine and New Hampshire, and then worked for a large county park agency outside Washington, D.C. Uh, then a couple other things that, that to let you know that I actually have a lot of interest and in experience and uh, expertise, uh, like to think, in uh, a lot of land and water resource uh, elements. Uh, here in the state of Maine, we want them across the country. But today's workshop, if we had all the time in the world, I had an hour and a half presentation time frame, this is what I would be sharing with you, interpretive messaging, what it is, where it can be found, a variety of methods of delivery, some a talk about some publication aspects, some key elements for that. Waysides and kiosks, uh, uh, so how they can be an important element to uh, uh, communicate the story of your lake association and what you're trying to do and protect the lakes. Some fabrication installation, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, kind of basics of compliance with it. If you put a wayside and a kiosk in there, you should really, even though you may not be required to, you should strive to meet ADA standards and some nationwide resources for how to get this stuff. And how, who, do, who do I contract to find a wayside and things of that nature? So. But I have to start off since many of you, many of you may already know this. And, uh, forgive me if this is a refresher course, but interpretation, uh, what is it? I, I like to tell the story of when I was a frontline interpreter for at Hidden Pond Nature Center. My, um, mo you know, I do this now with my own kids. You go to parties, neighborhood parties, and what do you talk about? Well, you know, po politics, of course, but you also talk about what your kids do and what they're doing and how many grandchildren you might have. And uh, so my mother and father were at a party across the street at Mrs. Rapp's house, and a visitor from England was uh, in attendance, and she said, oh, well, you know, what do your children do? And so my mother said, oh, my, my oldest daughter, child is a librarian, and actually in England, the Berkshire County Library System. And, my oldest son is an English teacher at a local high school, and, and my um, youngest is a naturalist at a local park. And uh, the woman looked at him carefully and said, at, really? And she said, yes, he's, a, he's, he's an interpretive naturalist at a local park. And she says, wow, doesn't it get rather cold? <laughs> and uh, my mother says, well, you know, Washington, D.C. area, it does get a little bit kind of cold. No, but I mean, he's got no clothes on. And then it dawned on my mother that the woman had misinterpreted the, the word and thought she had said nature. And then, of course, my mother backtracked really quickly, turned blue, uh, completely ran and said, no, 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 he's an interpretive naturalist. He, he does walks and talks for uh, school children about nature. And she says, oh, that's very interesting. Anyway, so it all started back in the 50s. Um, many of you may have heard, many of you may have actually remembered this. 
Uh, in the 50s, the uh, Secretary of Interior, working with the National Park Service, said the attendance at national parks across the country had skyrocketed after World War II. It had been somewhere floating around 20 to 25 million prior to World War II, but after World War II, it skyrocketed to around 70 million visitors a year. And of course, now it's around 310 million visitors per year. So the parks were not designed for that amount of visitors. So there was a plan to have a, a uh, the Secretary of Interior and Director of the Park Service said, we need a, a plan to bring the infrastructure for the parks up to grade. And um, so we're going to call it Mission 66. Within uh, 10 years, we're going to have millions of dollars worth of infrastructure. And it was including things like bathrooms and campgrounds and picnic areas and things of that nature. A really important project, but also with that was to communicate the story of the national parks to the, uh, to the population, the visitors. So they, they contracted with Freeman Tilden. Freeman Tilden was not a naturalist. It was, he was a writer, a playwright, had been several plays on Broadway and written extensively as non-fiction and fiction books. But he was actually asked by the Park Service to do my dream job. He was hired by the Park Service to visit every national park over a course of a, ne a year and write about it. Oh. And, and then write a, and publish a book called A Guide to the National Parks. And so <laughs> up until that point in time, there had never been a comprehensive guide to the national parks. There had been selected ones but not necessarily a handy uh, field guide for visitors to sort of explore the geology and the story. And that's where Freeman Tilden discovered that the rangers at the time were doing much more than just enforcing the rules and protecting the resource and having campfire programs. They were using thematic approaches and telling the story behind the scenery of the national parks. So he, came up, he coined the word interpretation. And it led to him publishing a book called uh, Interpreting Our Heritage, which then led to a, a communication and whole thematic approach to how visitors to parks, to lakes, can interpret the, uh, the resource, and then therefore lead to stewardship and protection of the resource. Uh, it was for the that's his definition. It, it feels very clinical at this point in time. It still has some really f sound foundations. Ed educational activity, which aims to reveal meanings and relationships to the use of original objects, which could be the mountains, or it could be a historic artifact, or it could be an archaeological dig, or a building, and first hand experience. Um, and by using illustrative media, media rather than simply communicating factual information. As I tell my students at Unity when I teach the interpretation classes for about 100 students a year, uh, it's the object in hand that tells the story. And that's what makes it different than just a really great presentation. Uh, it's actually having the object in hand, the resource in hand that tells that story. And as Lake Association members, your resource is outside your, uh, your steps and at the end of the road and you have that resource that you can tell. Sam Hamm at University of Idaho uh, went on, has a more, he's probably the, the current world leader, a spokesperson for interpretation, uh, really uh, excellent academic, but also a real, uh, his book on interpretation that is used it extensively throughout colleges, universities in the country, is uh, translated in about 15 different languages. And, really well known. NEI, the National Association for Interpretation, is the national and international organization for interpreters of natural and cultural resources. They are the, uh, the ones who promote the profession and have lots of training and opportunities and have been involved with them for many years. Their, their uh, definition is it's a communication process that forges educational, oh, pardon me, emotional and intellectual connections between the interests of the visit, the uh, audience and the inherent meanings of the resource. Making that connections between the people and knowing what they want to know and hearing what they want to know and the resource itself. And of course the National Park Service, the leading uh, one agency in the country for interpretation, about 2,000 full-time interpreters around the country uh, annually, not including seasonal, just full-time. Uh, their definition is a little bit longer. 
you know, federal government, so it's a little bit. Okay. So methods of delivery. There are a variety of methods of delivery of telling your story. And I just want to share with you this one piece that's really vital, is I'm a big theme person. And how I, when I show up at a, like I just came back from the Black Hills after a meeting, went to all the parks and uh, historic sites in the area, and the one connecting theme that I saw from that was almost all the sites did a really effective job of telling the story thematically of connecting the, of humans with the resources. And whether it's Mount Rushmore or Jewel Cave or Wind Cave or um, Scotts Bluff National Monument, they did a really great job of telling that story, that connection between the human interactions with nature and the culture. And so I was at a conference a couple of years ago, and um, let me just sit down right here. And uh, it was in Ohio, and I I've been to Ohio lots of times before, but I didn't realize that Ohio actually has had an extensive uh, canal system that connected itself to Lake Erie and then to the Erie Canal tra and transporting uh, the breadbasket of the Midwest, uh, what was then at the Northwest, to the East Coast. And I saw this book. Uh, for, at one of the silent auctions, the Ohio Canal. And I thought, oh, that looks pretty interesting. I think I'll bid on that. Plus, it wasn't that expensive. Ohio's bid looked like around two dollars. So I thought, okay, I can afford that. And so it's a really nice book about the story and the connections and historical aspects of the Ohio Canal system. And then I realized it wasn't just a book for sale on the auction. It was also a mini display map that shared where the Ohio canals were. I thought, oh, that's really nice. It's a book, map, something visual, something to put in your hand. It's thematically connected. Oh, and then I realized there was also this. This is like revelation that I'm bidding on something that I thought was only $2, and it was actually three things. I ended up paying a whopping $7 for it. <laughs> and inside was a CD with the lyrics of uh, not old time, but people singing songs about the Ohio Canal system and what the uh, uh, canal boatman was singing to drive uh, the canals along the canal. Wonderful connections. And it turns out all these products are sold at sites throughout the state of Ohio who have that Ohio Canal connection. The Cuyahoga Valley uh, National Park has all these things in the sale items that's thematically connecting the store. Some of you actually may very well have uh, products that you use as gifts for donors or annual gifts for contributors. And I think of one of my all-time favorite ones is, anybody have an idea what this is? No. It is a spoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, right. <laughs> it's actually a replica of the spoon they had at Alcatraz. And, uh, and then they tell the story about, you know, Alcatraz, of course, was a famous prison at one point in time. And if you ever get to San Francisco, you should go on the tour. It's phenomenal. But it tells the story. And the fact the spoon is much more than a spoon, it was actually a dangerous weapon by the prisoners at Alcatraz. And the story, it's much more than just a gift you can buy. The Park Service and the Friends Group could just sell the spoon and people would buy. But it's much more than that because they're, they're continuing the story through products that you can sell or give away as gifts to your donors or uh, board members or retiring uh, board members that tell that story. And I met, I heard uh, Maggie earlier this morning telling the story about, or maybe it was, uh, maybe it was you that said, you know, uh, you know, have a map. Actually, it was you. It was a map, and you know, the maps are a really key point. But just giving a map without that sort of interpretive messaging is. A uh, fault if you don't have that. I've lost my uh, clicker. There it is. So there's two things I just like to share with publications, whether they newsletters or, or uh, waysides or other types of publications. And there's two messages I really want to share with you. One is it's really important to have active voice versus passive voice in your writing because that's what attracts people to it and draws them in. And of course, the personal example, I don't mind sharing the story because I've actually learned to be a little bit better writer than I was at the time. But my first job at Hidden Pond Nature Center, I got in 
charged with writing a guide to Royal Lake Park. Was, there was a trail around the park, and we set some stations up, and it was a, just, I called it the Curious Naturalist Guide to uh, Royal Lake Park. I wrote the text, got the graphics, sent it off. My boss said, fine. They went on to the chief naturalist, and I happened to be passing his office. And Bill called me in and said, Tom, could you, could you come in here for a second? Of course, I was like 23. And you get called into the chief naturalist's office. You know, all of a sudden, my palms are sweating. And he says, have a seat. And, he said, and, his, and I said, oh, is something wrong, Bill? And he said, no, 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 you're not in trouble. But I, I, I was just reading over your brochure. And he said, no, what'd you think? And he said, well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's grammatically correct. But I have to tell you, Tom, you're writing like a bureaucrat. <laughs> oh. I felt like I'd just fallen down off a cliff. I said, oh, wow, Bill, I don't, I'm really sorry. I didn't realize that. He says, yeah, so he got all the content right. Just rearrange things to make it into active voice versus passive voice. And I said, Bill, I went to college, but you're, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and, he, and he gave me a couple examples. And I said, oh, OK, I can do that. So now I act with my, my students and my writing at Unity, and especially when we're working with groups like yourself, using the active voice is so important to drawing in the audience. So, and the other one is interpretive writing is very different than essay writing. So, if you need a primer, Alan Lethbridge has written a book. It's actually not that expensive. I think it's around $16 if you buy it on Amazon. Uh, Alan Lethbridge is a uh, Wonderful writer, former professor at Unity, pardon me, Humboldt State College, uh, State University. He left the college after about 20 years just because he wanted to live near Glacier National Park. Pretty brave. He had a tenured position and just left. But um, he's written this book, and it's a wonderful explanation about how you can interpretively write better and more effectively. And then I just added this slide in this week. And hopefully you don't take offense at it. We'll see. Hey, here, there's really two types of voice writing. There's an active voice, you ate six donuts. Passive voice, six donuts were eaten by you. And then the passive, <laughs> passive aggressive voice. Don't worry, I can see you. Yeah, I thought about this as I was driving and stopped about the voice. So, this, this is really not in the lexicon of the Oh, darn. Yeah, I know. But that's a really good example. And uh, I added this, I've done this presentation, similar presentation. Last of uh, with a couple land trust conferences this past year, and they all said, hey, you know, would you have an example of uh, active versus passive? So here's a minor example. But how about your publications? Whether it's a newsletter, or a brochure, or a uh, small pamphlet. We don't have time in the session today, but Sam Ham in his book, uh, Interpretation Making a Difference on Purpose, he says that you should have all your publications meet the criteria of TOR, thematic, organized, relevant, and entertaining or enjoyable. And if you take your publication and have an external person take it, not you because you have too much of a personal interest in it, score it one to seven. Is the publication thematic? Is uh, the publication organized or does it seem scattershot? Uh, how relevant is it to the intended audience and entertaining and enjoyable? Now, obviously, it'd be great if you had score, you know, if it scored seven on all of the features, but that's unrealistic. But the more set towards seven you have on all the tour features, the more engaging your publication will be. Uh, so, waysides and kiosks. Some quick definitions for you, and and I ask, I mention this because a lot of the lake associations have properties that are commonly held, and you say, oh, let's put up a kiosk or a wayside to engage people about the organization and protecting the lake resource and things of that nature. So for my purposes, for waysides, I'm talking about the uh, standalone, not unlike this right here. You see this at state parks, national parks, and other facilities. It might be made out of iron or steel, or maybe made out of uh, a wood structure. But it's a freestanding, and it's not unusual for it to be two by three. That's the, is the standard size. Kiosk, this is the freestanding bulletin board that you might see at the parking lot. And if you all have some common property with a parking lot, 
I bet you you have a kiosk sitting there. But I'm also guessing that many of your kiosks may look like the school bulletin board you had in elementary school. And that's, that's a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, but fabrication is the actual part process by which you fabricate the wayside exhibit or the kiosk materials. And I have examples of all sorts of materials that are make, you can make these out of, ranging from really low cost to really high cost, depending on your budget and your resources. And then installation. Great example I have with this is, you know, a couple years ago we, uh, at Unity, we uh, had a grant to create some waste sites around campus to talk about how great Unity is at sustainability, which it is, of course. Just like our colleague at, colleagues over at Colby really good at that. Got that? Yeah, anyway, uh, so we had some waste sites uh, produced. And the first thing is when the, the gentleman who was in charge of it, uh, there were some challenges with it. One is we had to figure out how to uh, really effectively get as many signs as possible with the grant because they were, we estimated the signs to be about three to four hundred dollars a piece. And so that was a challenge. How many signs to get, how to produce them. And the other one was when he got them all shipped back after having them produced, it dawned on him, hmm, I hadn't thought that I needed to put them in something to install them in the ground. So that actually ended up being some extra mo more money than anticipated because he thought, wow, I get these signs, they'll just come with the uh, installation aspects of things. And so that cost a little bit more and there were other challenges with that I'll talk about later. So some uh, basic questions, and some of these slides I'm just gonna pop right through. But the most important thing is to ensure a smooth and efficient process, you need to think about these things. I just want to really talk about who will be working on the project and what is everyone's specific role, how do you reach consensus. And with that in mind, I don't mind sharing horror stories with you. But here's a, a classic 2 by 3 wayside that we produced as part of this project several years ago about Unity College. And so let me just go around the room, I'll just scan you, let you, let you all this, and I want you to think, what are the challenges or problems with this wayside? Too much too much really yeah, it's too like hard. way too, too many notes. Busy. It's like super busy. <laughs> and it's like too many words, it's kind of cluttered, there's some funky white spaces, it seems to have all sorts of. Oh yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned it. Right. So uh, clearly somebody's going to be looking at this a little bit closer, but it, it's not actually meeting all the ADA standards, although we're not required to do that, but it certainly makes sense to actually to shoot for that. But there was one immediate problem with this wayside, and the reason why I can use it as an example for presentations in my classes and at conferences and things. Does anybody have an idea? What, anybody familiar with Unity College's campus? Yeah, so they produced this. They took a little bit longer than they anticipated the pl from planning to implementation. And it took about a year. And I'll talk about why that was. In between sending it off to the uh, fabricator and getting them back, we built three new buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so the, built, the map was instantly out of date. The, the three buildings that aren't on this map. So with that in mind, it was crucial that if you're designing such things, do not make them so that you have uh, information that's going to be inaccurate in a timely fashion. A colleague of mine over in New York, uh, Land Trust, <coughs> he said they created these really nice waysides and in, embedded in the wayside also was the, uh, the story about how, oh, on this site they'll be in within 10 years. Uh, a hotel with uh, visitor services, it's never there. And it's been 15 years, so she said, oh, that was a mistake to put such unknown things into a wayside. The biggest problem with this wayside uh, construction, um, who's working on the project, and what is everyone's specific role? Why is this content so much? Because there were too many people involved in the project. 
Everybody wanted their hand and the messaging for all the waysides, from the first frontline person to the president of the college. So it was a, it was a wayside project by committee, not necessarily delegating the responsibility to key people. And they never asked me. <laughs> hey, uh, the, real quick thing, do you need any sign permits? What is your budget constraints? What's your timetable? Uh, Bill Bechter, the guy who gave me the advice in active versus passive, he said, oh, when you're doing a project planning, and figure, calculate it all out, and then double it, because that usually is what it turns out. It's always longer than you think it's actually aspect. And the sign permit thing is a really key element for many of you all, especially in public access areas. Don't do what uh, this other organization I work with, the Walden County Trails Coalition did. We, we created this Hills to Sea Trail community to Belfast. And they said, uh, we put the sign up, said, Hills to Sea Trail, right here. And within a couple days, we had the main DOT writing us a letter. It was so polite. <laughs> it was like cease and desist. We moved the sign within a week, or we're going to take it down and you'll never see it again. But that's it. We didn't realize that we had to have it with a certain number of feet from the setback. And it was much farther setback than you might anticipate. So. Woman over in New York at this conference I presented at, she told some real horror stories about signs in different towns and then the ordinances for different towns. So definitely check about that. So I'm going to skip through this, but you can range all sorts of prices from laminated signs to uh, fiberglass embedded in porcelain, which cost uh, hundreds if not thousands of dollars but I just wanted to really share this element right here visitors remember 10% of what they hear 30% of what they read 50% of what they see 90% of what they do if you can make your exhibit wayside interactive that means the message is going to be communicated one good example I can think of is uh, folks who operate um, let's see if I can see it real quick um, Tour me. They're the ones who make these wands that you can, in museums, you can listen to more stories. They actually make this hand crank or solar installed. If you have a remote location, you don't have electricity, but you want to have some sort of interactive aspect for your wayside, they actually have a, um, well, it's expensive, about $500, but in the big scheme of things, it might be uh, less expensive. Uh, a hand crank electricity generator that you can actually then press a button and listen to bird calls and loons calling and things of that nature. Or a solar powered installed one that you can do the same type of thing. But, this is why it's in really big letters. Bottom line is remember effective wayside kiosk exhibits contain fewer than 300 words. That's really hard. Plus or minus one or two, but that's a hard line and feature no more than four to five graphic images. So, key element is, the walk-by aspect is, you have about four to five seconds to grab the attention of the visitor, or the experience, the person. And if you grab their attention, you've got about 25 seconds to read the voice. Nobody's going to go to the historical society like I do and read all the text at these museums. Uh, I'm not the usual visitor. Uh, and it, for most folks, 25 seconds at a wayside is a long time. Hey, I'm just going to mention a quick thing, a couple of resources that you can do on the interpretive planning process for waysides. Then I'm going to get, skip right to this part. The National Park Service, the Forest Service, and other federal agencies have really great guidelines for ADA, Americans with Disabilities. Placing them at the right height, the wayside should be at 24 to 30 inches max, the bottom part of it, because otherwise children, but also anybody who has a physical disability, can't read the wayside. Factors consider, it's all outlined. And actually I have some, and actually I have the website hot links in the presentation. But I actually have some copies of the uh, NPS ADA guidelines. And then the last thing, I, oops, let's see, I had one other, oh, right here. You don't know how to start, and, but you have a grant and you have some funding about planning, or who do I go to pra uh, fabricate waste or materials or public public sites, uh, publication. The National Association for Interpretation publishes an annual uh, green pages of interpretive resource development. 
And so you can, it's free, you can go online, download it uh, to NEI's website, but it's hot linked in the presentation. It gives not a, com a total comprehensive list, but a really great way to start. If you were looking at doing some waysides or exhibits or publications, there's a whole bunch of people who can help you um, meet your goals and objectives. I think I've got about a minute. Mm -hmm. Are there any quick questions? So three minutes. Oh, I've got three minutes. Oh, and if, if that's the case, I just all sorts of publication materials right here. But I wanted to share with you. It's funny how sometimes exhibitors can uh, contractors for publications can can have revelations when they have new people show up at their. Uh, their workshop. So Image Lock, uh, Gopher Signs, make this really nice sign. It's made out of metal. This is a key element, uh, depending on the vandalism aspects of your site, for your key, for your wayside or your kiosk. Uh, some you have to be careful. Think about what the possibilities of vandalism are. And so. This product right here is a metal product, a really nice photographic image. And I was talking to the, the owner of the company, and I said, oh, you know, how much does a sign like you know, two by three cost? He said, well, actually, it's competitive. It might be about $200 to $250. But my, uh, one of my new exhibit team back home came to me and said, Tom, uh, John, you know, we make these signs, and people will do it. But, you know, for about 50 bucks more, all we have to do is flip it over, and we can use the same sign on the other side. And then you get sort of like two signs for this price of one. And it says, that's great, because these, you know, if you paint or scrape, it might want to say, oh, I have to replace it. So you just flip it over, as opposed to some of the other really nice material, like a fiberglass embedded sign, which is really nice, but it's not possible to put the image in the back. And I'm not getting paid by Gover Sign. I'm just telling you that depending on what your product and the placement and location that you practice things, if you don't have a vandal issue, then you can have really nice signs and really nice locations that draw people in and tell that message. And the most important thing I'll just leave with you is uh, on your kiosk, they end up often looking like bulletin boards. And one of the things that you often see on the kiosk is uh, rules. Don't do this, don't do that. And how you message that rules into an interpretive messaging, constructive versus, versus negative, can greatly impact compliance by the visitors. Hey, thanks. And I'm going to be around the rest of the day. If you have any other questions, and if it's okay with Susan, I'll just leave this stuff up until sure. the end of the day. Great. So during breaks or walking around, you can take a certain look at it. And now I think we're on to septic systems.